Let's go ahead and open our Bibles tonight to Philippians chapter 4. Uh, two main passages we're going to look at this evening. Philippians chapter 4, you may want to find your place in Matthew chapter 6 as well. Philippians chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 6. We're glad to be able to be uh, a part of uh, your evening tonight as the Lord works in our hearts. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. Notice, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We'll stop there, and we'll go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word. Lord, we're grateful that you have the answer to everything that we need for this life and for the life hereafter. And so I pray as I preach the message that I truly believe you've led me to preach tonight, would you please fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit, lead and direct my thoughts and my words this evening, and may your word go forth with power and clarity this evening. Please help us, Lord. I do pray if someone's listening tonight that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, that tonight would be the night that they get that settled and trust Christ. Lord, I know this message is primarily to believers, and so I pray as we look another, at another one of man's problems that you'd give us victory uh, in this area of life. And so please help me, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Years ago, the story is told about a husband and wife, and this is a familiar story and a true story, that after years of raising children, they had just watched their last child, their son, get married. And they were now empty nesters. And my wife says amen. Now, I know sometimes we say amen. We love our children. We do. We miss them dearly. We had a wonderful time with them. But it is that next stage of life. Uh, and the couple was sharing with each other some of the struggles that they were going through, adjusting to their new situation. It was hard for them to go to bed at night without keeping an ear uh, turned to the door as they did before, as they waited for their son to come home. Uh, it was hard for them to uh, sit there at the dinner table and not wait for him for meals and things like that and to look at the empty seat and so forth. Uh, the house was much quieter, just a different kind of situation. And the mother especially was somewhat uh, sad at the thought that he was gone, her son. And as they were discussing this back and forth, the husband and wife, her husband turned to her and said this, but honey, now your worries are over. And she replied saying this, yes, dear, but you know that I'm not happy unless I'm worrying. You know, many people's lives, though not necessarily saying those words, would testify to that same fact that uh, it seems like their life is routinely characterized by worry. That worry is a part of their lives. That's just what they do. By the way, does that describe you? Would you consider yourself a worrier? Would you think of yourself as somebody who gets all uptight over certain things? By the way, there's lots to worry about today. Uh, life is not as simple as it used to be with all the information we get, with all the news we get. Uh, I mean, think about what's going on even this day as we are dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, as we're watching the economy stumble, as we're looking at uh, the stock market had dropped, I think, about a third over the last few months. Uh, we're seeing the supply chain and how it's now becoming hard for food to get from the farm to the stores. Uh, uh, we're, uh, how are you dealing with all of these challenges? Are you wringing your hands and, and worrying? Well, God has the answer for that. You know, for a few weeks now, we've been looking at the subject of God's answers for man's problems. And we're seeing that there are certain problems that every human being in every culture in every time period have faced. And we talked about the fact that they're not new. Uh, they're not novel to this age. They may have a different face uh, or a different name. But these problems that mankind typically deal with have existed since the fall of man. 
And we've been talking about the fact that for all of these problems, God has the answer. Uh, his word does have the answer. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Uh, God's word has the answer. And we looked at several different problems already, just kind of beginning this series a few weeks ago. Uh, the first one we looked at was man's problem of suffering. Why do we suffer and how do we deal with that as believers? Then we look at man's problem of guilt. What is guilt? Is guilt a good thing or is guilt a bad thing? We talked about that as well. Then last week, I believe it was, we dealt with man's problem of disappointment. How you and I always have to deal with being disappointed in people and in things. Now tonight we're going to look at man's problem of worry. Worry. You may say, well, I'm not a person that worries. Maybe you're not, but you still have to deal with it. You still have to deal with that struggle and all the challenges that we face in this world uh, 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 that we might fall into uh, worrying. So tonight we're going to find out what is it? What is this thing called worry? How can I say, well, this is worry and this is not? What is it? Why we do it? and how you and I can have victory over worry. Now you should have your sheet tonight, perhaps you do, perhaps you don't. I don't even have one tonight, but I have my outline, so that's good enough. But notice number one, you want to bring that up? That's fine. Number one, write this down, the explanation of worry. What exactly is worry? You know, it's interesting to note that the word worry is not found in the Bible. You go to a concordance, look at Strong's, take a Bible program, try to find worry, worried, and so forth. It is not found in the Word of God. Perhaps the reason is, listen to this, because the English word worry originally meant this, to annoy, to bother, or to vex. That's what it meant. Even up until 1828, I typically use the Webster's 1828 dictionary to look up the word. And I looked it up. I was surprised to see what it said. It defined worry as to tease. To worry someone means to tease them, uh, to trouble them, and to harass them. That's what the word used to mean. It wasn't until around 1860 that the word worry changed its meaning. Perhaps with all the psychobabble that was being developed, uh, more so today, but it began to be defined and used in a different way. It didn't. It didn't. Uh, no longer does it mean to annoy or to bother or to vex. Instead, as of 1860, it means this: to feel anxiety or mental trouble. That's what the word means. Now, the Bible words that are used to describe what we call worry are words like this. The word careful, uh, or being full of care. That's in our text, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Notice it says, be careful for nothing. That word careful or being full of care is used seven times in the Bible. Uh, another phrase that's used to describe worry is not only the word uh, careful, but the, wor the phrase taking thought. That is used ten times in the Word of God as well. Matthew 6.25. We're going to go there in a couple minutes here. But Jesus said this in his Sermon on the Mount. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Again, it's the same idea of that word worry, being full of care, careful, feeling anxiety or mental trouble. These words in the New Testament are all translated from the New Testament Greek word merimnao, which means this, it means to be anxious, uh, to have anxiety. That's the word, maybe a buzzword we use quite often today, or a familiar word. Uh, it means to be distressed, uh, to be troubled over something. You see, worry, understand what it is. It's more than simply thinking about the future. Some people say, well, Jesus said, take no thought for this and for that. 
So I guess I'm not supposed to think about the future, otherwise it's wrong, it's worth. No, 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 don't miss that. It's more than simply thinking about the future. It's more than simply planning about the future. It's more than simply making provision for what lies ahead. By the way, those things are biblical and a good idea to do. We are supposed to think ahead. We are supposed to plan for the future. We are supposed to make provision for what lies ahead. Planning and preparing is absolutely good. We read in 1 Timothy 5, 8, But if any provide not for his house, and especially for those of his own house, uh, he hath denied the faith uh, and is worse than an infidel. So notice there's a certain provision that I am responsible for. I'm not supposed to sit back and say, well, I guess God's going to take care of everything, therefore uh, I'll just wait for him to bring the groceries to my house. I'll wait for him to cut my grass. I'll wait him for, uh, for him to fill up my, my, my gas tank and my bank account. I'll just sit back and just wait on God and not worry about those things. That's not what worry is. We're supposed to plan. We're supposed to, again, think and make provision for the future. Luke chapter 14 and verse 28, a familiar parable says this, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Sounds like planning to me. Sounds like preparing to me. So again, when we think and plan and make provision for the future, that is not worrying. One commentator said this about worry, and I like it, and you'll see it if you have your handout tonight. You'll see it, uh, this is what I wrote down as far as the definition is concerned. He said, biblically speaking, worry is the anxious care that comes from assuming a responsibility which we are incapable of discharging. Now think through that, I know that's a mouthful, but think through it for a moment. It is an anxious care when I assume a responsibility that I have no control over. Uh, you know, there are things that we can do as human beings, and there are things that we can control to an extent. Then there are things that we cannot do and things that we cannot control. That's impossible. And so understand, we have to make a distinction between those two things if we're going to understand how to deal with worry, uh, because worry is when we get all twisted up about things that we cannot control, about things that are out of our control. It is uh, when we get into the what-ifs of life. Well, what if this happens? And what if this happens? And what if this happens? Now turn over with me to the passage I told you about a little bit earlier, Matthew chapter 6. Let's talk about that for a moment. Matthew chapter 6. This is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ is trying to teach his disciples in this sermon on the mount. Notice verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit under his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or, uh, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles see. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Uh, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That, take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. 
Now, I read that whole thing for a reason. I know it's a familiar passage, but I want, to, I want you to think for a moment or notice for a moment, and maybe you have already, uh, but I didn't until I started putting this together, of how many times we see the words take and thought. Sometimes take thought or take no thought. Uh, notice verse 25. Uh, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. Verse 27. Which of you by taking thought? Look at verse 28. And why take ye thought? Uh, look at verse 31. Therefore take no thought. And then verse 34. Take therefore no thought. Notice how many times Christ is saying it. In other words, don't be so filled with anxiety. Don't be full of care over these things. He's not saying don't think about them. He's saying don't get caught up in the what ifs of life. What might happen, what could happen. Things that you and I have absolutely no control over. Now, in this passage, we see two general areas that the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking of uh, about worry. The first one, and these are areas that you and I have to guard about worry as well. Number one, or letter A, is this. Material provision. Notice verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink. Verse 28, he's talking about things that are tangible here. Eating, drinking, things like that. Verse 28 talks about why take ye thought for raiment. That's clothing. Look, look at verse 34. kind of sums them up again. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? You see, when Christ is speaking of what we eat, and what we drink, and our raiment, and what we put on, what he is speaking of is the material things in life. Things like food, and clothing, things like shelter. Things like furnishings for our homes. Things like our bank accounts. Uh, things like financial investments. Again, it's not wrong to buy food. It's not wrong to purchase clothing. He's not saying don't think about those things. Uh, it's not wrong to stop your, stock your covers with food. It's not wrong to save money for the future. Again, there are biblical principles about doing those things. We worry when we, when we fret ourselves with questions like this. Well, what happens if the meat supply runs out? Questions like that. I don't get this. I don't understand people's thinking. Maybe I'm, uh, probably I'm the weirdo. But I didn't understand when this, and by, by the way, I, I feel bad for those that have lost people through, uh, from the coronavirus or that caught it and got sick. I'm grateful that I haven't. But I don't understand how people think. Why did everybody run out and get toilet paper? I don't understand that. I just don't get it. Uh, why, why, why? I went to the store yesterday, put my mask on, right? Did the whole first time in uh, with that. And uh, no butter. We went to three stores before we could find butter. And I thought, hmm, I, I don't get it. And, and then uh, 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 ground beef, you know, just certain kinds of ground beef. You know, wasn't there. Went to several stores. Again, and I know what it's the supply chain and those things. I get all that, but I, I'm just, I just, I, I, I'm just saying we could fret about. Oh no, what if this is my last hamburger? You know, I, oh no. What if I have to use the phone book or something like that? Anyway, um, I'm just saying, you know, we fret over the... That's the thing my dad used to say, by the way. But we could fret. You see, it's not about buying something or planning. It's about when you and I fret about things out of our control. What happens if the stores close down? Uh, things like this. What happens if a tornado strikes my house? What happens if we have an earthquake uh, uh, and something happens? What happens if the stock market crashes? What happens if the economy crashes? Uh, what happens if my workplace shuts down? What happens if my job lays me off? Uh, we, we fret about these types of things. That is worry. Those things I'm talking about 
are things out of our control. We fret about things like this. Who will watch over my kids in college when I send them off? By the way, we're the first child to leave our house to go to school was Justine. And let me tell you something, that was a tough thing. Bringing her down there, and she had been in our house for all those years, and we were a very close family. That changed the, uh, the whole family when she had gone down there, just because one person was gone. But when we went down there, I'll tell you what, one of the hardest things my wife and I had to do was drive away and look at her and see her through that window and know we're leaving her, in our mind, to the wolves. It wasn't to the wolves, but I'm just saying, that's what worry does. What's going to happen? Who's going to take care of her? Dad's not there. Mom's not there. Is she going to be okay? You see, all of that. People do that when they have children, newborn babies. They get all fretted and worried over, will my child get sick? Are they going to come down with some disease? Or is there something going to happen to them? Sudden infant death syndrome, those types of things. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Uh, that is worry. You see, when, when we get all twisted up about things that we cannot control, uh, control, that is worry. And we can do that about tangible, material things. But there's another thing he talks about. Not only is it the first general area that we can worry about that we see in this passage anyway, material provision, am I going to have enough, am I going to do this, the second general area we can worry in is the area of our, make sure I read it right, our physical health. You say, where do you see that? Look at verse 25. At the end of the verse, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Talking about the body there. Look at verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his, unto his stature. You see, we can get worried when we, when we uh, uh, fret uh, over things out of control concerning material provisions. Is God going to take care of me? But then also we can fret about our physical health. Again, it's a good thing to do things like eat right, I think that's important. Uh, to, you, say you do? I do. I really, I think it's important, but you know, anyway. Uh, uh, to exercise, uh, uh, maybe to whatever, take vitamins or get a proper night's rest. Uh, again, it's good to do things like that and even to think about things like that. You know, you've got to watch our health uh, uh, and, and do those things in an effort to maintain a healthy body. That's not worry. Worry is when we fret over things out of our control. By the way, Proverbs 23, 21 says, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. That's things that are in our control. We control, by the way, what we put in our mouths. Nobody forces us to eat. I don't know about you, but I've been eating a lot of things during this COVID-19 crisis, you know. I mean, we have time, a little bit more time than usual and uh, I've been eating a lot of chips and snacks and that kind of thing. Anybody else with me on that, you know? We're all talking about the, the weight we're gaining, you know? We all have, I, I got a haircut, but I know it's not easy to get a haircut. You got to find somebody, you know? We're walking around with shabby hair a few days ago, I was anyway. And, and we're getting a little bit, you know, some of the suits aren't fitting like they used to. And so again, there is a, there is a human side for me to be concerned, and maybe I'll use that word, or to think about those things. And that's a good thing. But we, when worry comes in, in this matter of physical health, is when we fret ourselves with questions like this. What if I catch the coronavirus? What happens if I have an accident? Um, what happens if I die today? Or tomorrow? Or the next day? Uh, how will I die? That's worry. Uh, what if I get cancer? What if I get kidney, uh, kidney disease? What if I have a heart attack? What about my parents and my grandparents and their health? You know, they're getting older, and I don't know. I mean, they could come down with something. And how about my, 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 my children? And then what if they come down with something? That's worry. That's not a good thing. 
in because we're getting all twisted up over things that we cannot control. That's exactly what worry is. You see, worry gets us caught up in the what might be, what could be, what do I think? I, I mean, all kinds of we could think. What are they thinking? What's going on? All those uh, things that enter into our minds. Assuming that responsibility that we are incapable of changing. That's what worry is. So let me ask you something. You a worry wart? That's what we used to call it, worry wart, you know? Are you a person that's you just, you just worry and worry and worry and worry and worry. You know, all of us struggle with that. I struggle with that. I do. But let me ask you, are you a habitual worrier? Has that become a part of your life? Is that something you deal with day in and day out and day in and day out? If it's not this, it's that. If it's not this, it's that. Worry, 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 worry. It's not a good thing. In fact, I want to see something about it that might make us all rethink what that means. So we see, number one, the explanation of worry. Number two, let's consider the destruction of worry. That's right, I said destruction. Destruction. You say destruction of worry? Yes. You see, do you know that the idea of being anxious over things, the idea of being full of care, the idea of being all, all, all wrapped up and twisted up about things out of your control, is not something that the Bible commends. As a matter of fact, it's something that the Bible condemns. Condemns. Worry is not a good thing. I'll show you why here in a moment. Two things that you and I have to understand about worry. Because, you know, when we think of, well, I'll get ahead of myself a little bit, that's okay. When we think of a sin, we think of these, whoa, whoa. You know, adultery, pornography, fornication, you know, carousing the town, uh, uh, you know, those, those big stuff. We all seem to give ourselves a free pass with some other things. You ever notice that? You know, because we all do it. Well, worry is one of them. Uh, it is. Two things we have to understand about worry. Number one, or letter A, is this. It destroys our fellowship with God. It does. It destroys it. Worry is indeed a spiritual problem. Well, that's just the way I am. No. No. A thousand times no. It is not just the way you are. You choose to do it. But more than a spiritual problem, watch this. I'm going to justify what I'm going to say here. I'm just going to go ahead and throw it out there. I gave you a kind of an indication of what I was going to say a moment ago. Worry is a sin. It is. Now I'm helping myself tonight because I have the same uh, world that I live in, you do, the same things. Uh, you know, I have a mom that's older and, you know, you start thinking about that. I have kids and grandkids and, you know, if you're not careful, here we go. Down the worry, worry, wart lane, if you will, it is a sin. You see, the Bible does not deal with worry as merely a personality weakness. It doesn't deal with worry as a bad character trait. It doesn't deal with worry as an oops, or well, a, a little failure there. No, the Bible deals with it as a sin. And I'll prove it to you. Here's why. Understand, you understand this. God clearly commands his children not to worry. I read some to you, Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing. That's a command. It's not a, hey, you know, you, if, if you can, you know, I know you've got a lot of pressure in 2020 and all the things that are going on, and I know this is a lot for you, hard to handle, so, you know, if you, if you could try not to worry, that'd be wonderful. No. He says, be careful, be full of care, be anxious, for nothing. Matthew 6, 25. Two verses I've already read. Uh, take no thought for your life. Don't be worried about your life. John 14, 1. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. That sounds like a command to me. Psalm 37 and verse 1. Fret not thyself. That means when I fret, I'm disobeying God. 1 Peter 5, 7, we're going to deal with this a little bit later. Casting all your care upon him, 
These are commands. Can I ask you, what, when, we, when God gives us a command and we do not obey it, what's that called? Sin. I heard you all say it at home. It came, it came through the, the camera. Sin. That's right, S-I-N. Uh, worry. So why, let me ask you this. Why is, it, why is it a sin? Why is it such a bad thing? I can't help it. Look what's going on. Watch the news. I mean, I, I, it gets me stirred up and cranked up, and, and I start to think about things. And you're telling me that's a sin? Why? I'll tell you why. Because worry assumes and implies some untrue things about God. But it does. It, it, it is worry, watch this, is a defamation of God's character. It is. Don't miss it. Uh, it, it. It implies that God is ignorant of our need. It implies that God, or that God is not concerned with our need. It implies that God will not take care of us. It implies that God has somehow forgotten us. It implies that God will not make good on what he has promised us. In essence, it is calling God a liar. It is implying that God is not trustworthy. That and more is what worry declares. Well, I never said that. No, I don't have to say it. That's what you're doing. And that's what I'm doing. That makes it a serious thing. So we must, first of all, Honestly face the fact that when we give way to worry, anxiety, anxious care, full of care, uh, to a concern over things that are out of our control, we are both disobeying and displeasing and even sinning against our Lord. That's what we're doing. And by the way, all sin is to be dealt with the same way. There's only one way to deal with sin, and that is this, to confess it to God and forsake it. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can I ask you something? How many times have we, I'm including myself in this, have we really confessed to God verbally, Lord, I worried today, and that worry was sin, and it was wrong, and I broke my fellowship with you, and I'm confessing that. Please forgive me. Not, how often do we do that? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't do it often enough, because I've accepted it. I just did it, and it's gone, and boom, okay, I'll just move on now. That's not how we deal with sin. We don't deal with any other sin that way, and that's why we can't deal with worry that way. You see, if we are constant worriers and, and we haven't dealt with it by talking to God, and I'm going to mention that a little bit more about that in a moment here, uh, then we are not right with God. Pretty strong words, but true. So worry destroys our fellowship with God. But there's a second thing that worry does, and that is this. It deteriorates our physical body. It does. Persistent worry takes a toll. It is a crippling sin. And I mean that literally. It can stifle us. It can, it can change our attitude. It is a, watch this, it is a fruitless exercise, isn't it? That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 27, I don't know if you're there, which of you, by taking thought, can add... Add one cubit unto his stature. Okay, let's everybody worry about something that we can't control. Worry real hard. I mean, real bad. I mean, do as, as much worry as you can put into it. And then ask yourself, did that change anything? The answer is it didn't. Do you know what it did to you and me? It made us a mess. An absolute mess. It, dis, it, it accomplishes nothing except to destroy the worrier. And, and, and those around you, too. In a recent article, How Worry Affects the Body, the author writes this, Chronic worrying can affect your daily life so much that it may interfere with your appetite, lifestyle habits, relationships, sleep, and job performance. 
Many seek relief by engaging in harmful lifestyles, habits, such as overeating, cigarettes, or using alcohol and drugs. The article goes on to say, daily excessive worrying causes the body's sympathetic nervous system to release stress hormones such as cortisol. These hormones can boost blood sugar levels and triglycerides. Stress hormones can have serious physical consequences, including suppression of the immune system, digestive disorders, muscle tensions, short-term memory loss, premature coronary artery disease, and heart attack. They can lead to depression and even suicidal thoughts. The point is this. Worry deteriorates your body. It takes a physical toll. We've all been there. Sleepless nights when we can't stop thinking about something that we're worrying about and we can't change it, but it keeps running through our mind and running through our mind. We lose sleep. We either have loss of appetite or we just eat, or whatever it may be. We have these so-called vices, if you will, uh, to try to get us to forget about what's happening. You see, worry also affects people around you. It'll affect your friends. It'll affect your spouse. It'll affect your children. You see, there is nothing, absolutely nothing good about worrying. Can I ask you tonight, are you destroying your life and yourself and your spiritual walk with God and your fruitfulness for God through worry? So we see the explanation of worry, number one. We see, number two, the destruction of worry. Again, the explanation is two ways we worry over material provision, physical health, the destruction of worry, number one, it destroys our fellowship with God. Number two, it deteriorates our physical bodies. And then number three, and this is, this is where, we, this is where our, we want to get help, right here, is that the solution to worry. So what's God's answer to worry? What is it? Do you know there are three parts to God's answer to worry? I'm going to give them to you, but understand, they have to all work together. You can't just have one or two or one and the other. You have to, we have to have all three of them. What are they? Here I am. Here's this world that I look around, and really, it's, I mean, if we, if we live by sight, it is a hopeless world with death and disease and aging and, and all the things that are going on. Uh, it's hopeless. How do I get over that as a believer? How do I get through this worry? Well, there's three ways again. Number one is this. And now, now, please, as cliche as this may sound, don't just let it fly by because it's going to, the first one is going to sound so cliche. And that is this. The first part is this. Faith. Faith. Isn't that what Christ was trying to say in the Sermon on the Mount to these disciples? Again, verse 25. Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. We understand what he's saying here, right? He's saying, look, God takes care of, of birds. He takes care of all of the natural world, and we are the crown of his creation, the one he extends his love to us so much that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. And you're telling me that he'd care about the birds more than he'd care about us? That's a faith problem. We don't believe him. You see, the word antidote to worry is simply trusting God. Now, we must have faith in two things. Here they are. Number one is this. Faith in who he is. Jesus said in John 14, 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Okay? What's he saying there? Don't worry. He just got done telling I preached you the Gospel of John. We understand it. They were in the upper room. He just got telling them all the mess was going to happen. Someone's going to betray. I'm going to get, I'm going to get arrested tonight. I'm going to nail to a cross. That's what's going to happen tonight. Can you imagine how they felt? You're leaving us? Here, after three and a half years, you, you're our lifeline. What are we going to do? We, we, we won't have you with us. How are we going to deal with this? He says, let not your heart be troubled. Watch this. You believe in God. Believe also in me. You know what he's saying there? 
Have faith in God and who He is. Can I ask you something, worry wart? How big is your God? How big is He? Is He little? He can do some stuff. Eh, he can do, maybe you got a medium God. He can take care of, you know, more than half the stuff. Or do we have a big God who can do anything? Isn't that the God we serve? Isn't that the God of the Bible? And then what kind of God is He? He's a loving God. He cares for us. He is an infinite God who can give us His infinite attention and has an infinite supply of everything and has an infinite love for us. What more can we ask for? Have faith in who He is. You see, when we doubt God and we worry about, I'm sorry, when we worry about the future, we doubt God. We doubt who He is. So faith in who He is. But then number two, we also need to have faith in what He's promised. Can I show you a verse in Numbers chapter 23? One of my favorite verses in Numbers. Numbers chapter 23. And look at verse 19. This should be every worry warts life verse for times of worry. Proverbs 23 and verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Watch this. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? You see, what happens when we... When we worry, we, we doubt who God is, and then we don't have faith in what he's promised. And here he's telling us, you're missing it. You, you're bringing God down to the level of man. You see, we're so used to man. You see, man promises stuff, and we don't do everything. We, we, we disappoint people. We say, oh, yeah, I'll do that, no problem. And then we don't. And he said, wait a minute, you, you don't understand. I'm not like that. I'm not like you. I am God. If I said it, I am going to do it. By the way, that also means that with, if we're going to have faith in what he's promised, we have to know what he promised, which means we have to know the Bible. We cannot be ignorant of his word. God has given to us so many precious promises, precious promises that are ours to claim by faith, and we must believe what he says to be true. That'll prevent worry. I heard one person write this. Most believers treat the Bible like we treat directions. When we buy an appliance or instructions, most of us don't ever read the directions. We try to figure it out on our own until something breaks. Then we go searching for the directions. Where's that manual at? Where is that anyway? A lot of people treat the Bible that way. That's when I go through. Oh, I'm saved. I'm good enough. You know, I'm good to go. And then... And then things, we get in trouble, and marriages fall apart, and families fall apart, we get into trouble in our lives. And all of a sudden we go back and say, oh no, I need something here, where, where is that, where is that? When all along we should be filling our hearts and lives with his word, so when the trials come, and the difficulties come, and the coronaviruses come, we know what he's promised us, and we don't have to worry. When we see our parents age, when we have children go off to school, when we have a newborn, we don't have to worry because we know he never leaves us nor forsakes us. He promises it, and he does it. So number one is faith. Two more real quick. That was the longer one. The second ingredient or part, I'm going to use this word, releasing. Releasing. You say, what do you mean by that? Go over to 1 Peter chapter 5. You, you might, the biblical word would be casting. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. Casting all your care, there it is, worry, filled with care upon him, for he careth for you. You see, it's not enough just to have faith in who he is and what he's promised. Now we have to implement that faith, faith by doing what? Casting that worry upon him. You know what the word casting means? It has several uses. You look up a strong 
concordance. It, it kind of has a way of to the idea of tossing away. But uh, it also can be used in this way. It means to turn over to someone else. It means to loosen the grip on that thing. It means to let go of it. You see, in order for you and I to have victory over worrying, God tells us, yes, to have faith, but then that thing we're worrying about, because you can have, have faith, but one thing hits us, and another thing hits us, and another thought hits us, and things we cannot control, what do we do with it? Is that we have to take those things that have entered into our minds, it sounds like a previous series I did, and cast it away, loose the grip of it, and give it back to God. You see, we must specifically release to the Lord that which is our worry. What's going to happen? What's going to happen with my newborn child? What, what if it? What if it gets sick? What if it catches something? What if it doesn't grow up? What if? What if an accident? Stop. You can't control that. Now there's things you can control, safety measures, that sort of thing. But there's things you can't control, and you need to release that to God. What about my daughter when she went to school? No, we're driving away. Oh, honey, what are we going to do? What, what's going to happen to her? Stop. You know, on that ride home, that 13, 12-hour ride, whatever it was, maybe 10, 11, I forget what it was. I did it so many times I should have it memorized. But that, that long ride, I had to do that again and again and again and again. Because every five minutes, what about this? No, Lord, this, we prayed about it. This was your will. She believed it. We believed it. God, you worked it out. She's yours. It's not easy to do. Can I ask you something? What do, you got your, what do you got your grip on tonight? What is it? What, do you, what are you worrying about? The future? Um, the health of somebody? The life of somebody? How long they're going to live? You know? You need to give it to God because it's out of your control. And boy, you're not going to be able to enjoy life if you don't. Because all you have to do is wrapped up in those thoughts. And you know what? We, the one we're so worried about, we don't even enjoy their presence because we're so worried about what may happen to them. Stop. So faith, release, and then number three, and finally we're done, and that is this. These are all together, prayer and supplication. Back to the beginning, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Again, we read in verse 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known Unto God. Now, I think that this is connected to what I said about releasing. You can say, how do I release? Right there. You and I, what we do is we go to the throne of grace. We find a spot, uh, whether it be on your knees or not on your knees somewhere, we come to God. This is the method by which the child of God commits his burden to the Lord. We verbalize it to God. We say, God, I, I'm giving this situation, this person to you. Lord, I know my mother's older. I know there's going to come a day. But I can't sit here and worry about that, uh, something I can't control. And so I give that to you. And help me just enjoy her while she's here and be a blessing while she's here instead of getting all wrapped up in those thoughts. So put your worry in the blank there. Can I ask you something? And I asked this a little bit earlier. I'm almost done right here. But when was the last time you, you actually went to God about your worry? And truly, by prayer and supplication, released it to him. Because what happens is what happens at the end of the verse. Uh, verse 7, I'm sorry. And the peace of God just passes all understanding so keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You say, well, I've done that, but, but I, I still don't feel the same. Then you didn't do it. Well, I've said those words, but I still feel that tension that's there. Then you didn't really release it. You said the words, but you, brought, you, didn't, lo you didn't loosen the grip. You kept it with you. And, and sometimes, by the way, this can happen to all of us. We give it to God, and then ten minutes later, on the, oh, 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 we're right back in the same boat. What do you got to do? Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Keep giving it to God. No, oh no, I'm not taking it. Lord, that's yours. Oh, no, no, no. I don't want that back. Lord, that's yours. Okay. Oh, there's that thought. No, no, no. Lord, I'm giving that to you. 
And the product is peace and no worry. You know, every generation has their own sets of phrases and cliches, you know. Nifty, cool, keen, you know, different, different phrases. One of the things I noticed today that's used a lot, and, and I don't know, I'm not, out of, I'm not in touch with these things, but I hear it a lot today. They'll say, oh, no worries. No worries. I want to ask you something. Is that true about you and me? Can we really say, no worries here? No worries. Or, are you worried? God has the answer. He has the answer. Faith, releasing, prayer, and supplication. And if you're not walking around with the peace of God that passes all understanding, and perhaps one of the problems is you're holding on to some thoughts, and you've put a burden on you that's out of your control. Can I encourage you tonight? Give it to God. Give it to him. He'll take it. Well, I don't want to do that to him. No, he'll, he'll take it. That's what he says. Cast your care upon me. Why? Because he cares for us. I'll take that. I, I got it. I got it. And he does. And he'll help us. Amen? All right, let's pray.